as well as going out and following animals, both tracking them with radio collars and roaming across a vast swath of land. as a lot of time spent just sitting and watching and recording behavior um, just in person. But before I get too far, I just need to stop and acknowledge uh, the land that I was working on and everything I'm talking about tonight uh, was on the traditional land of the Champagne and Asiac First Nations, which is in the southwestern corner of the Yukon on the edge of a Kluwani National Park. And I especially want to thank Agnes MacDonald for allowing us to work on her trap line. But to get started, I want to introduce you to a lynx. This is Max the lynx. And Max became one of the most famous lynx in the world. Um, and the story that I'm going to tell today is intertwined with Max's story. And the reason Max is really famous is if you go to the next slide, is Max became the poster child of Wild Canadian Year, a documentary that was filmed for the CBC, um, as well as being the poster child of being that for that program, he also got a whole little documentary, a side documentary filmed about him because he put up with a filmmaker named Sam Ellis who tracked him for 76 days. Um, and by the end of it, had realized that instead of trying to get away from Sam, Sam is a very incredibly large six foot three person who's in clumsy as can be, uh, learned that he could use Sam to scare all the hairs out and then kill them. <laughs> so by the end, instead of him running away from Sam, he was leading Sam around the forest and using him. But uh, Max's importance and uh, fame far goes beyond what he did with uh, Sam, but also Max's story starts with my story because Sam never would have found Max if it hadn't been for me following my career. So we're going to go back to the start, and we will come back to Max later on. And we'll talk a little bit more about why he's famous for more than just being on CBC and BBC. I'm going to go back to introducing who I am. So I grew up in rural places across Canada. I started out in BC. Um, I was born in Watson Lake, nearest hospital to Kaziar, and I was in Kaziar while it was still a place. Um, and then we moved when I was young to uh, a place called Sedgwick, Alberta, which is just east of uh, Edmonton. And then we moved to Ontario. And I grew up mostly in Ontario outside of a small place called Eganville. And it's outside of Eganville that, if you hit the next, that really determined what I was going to do with my life. This is the property that my parents owned. It's 18 acres of field and for woodlot that also borders a river. And for my childhood, I spent my childhood roaming this property. Um, and I knew this property inside and out. I knew where every animal lived and where to find them at different times of the year. I knew which frog ponds had which frog species. Um, but more importantly is as I was finishing my undergrad and trying to decide what to do with my life, um, I was spending time at home in the winter, and when I was at home, I was outside. And the biggest thing that happened was, as I was trying to figure out maybe what interests me, sitting on my parents' property in the middle of winter every Christmas break, and regardless of which Christmas break, I could go down to the river as it was just starting to freeze, and I could sit and watch these guys and the fam this whole family. There's a family of them. Um, and I would spend hours and hours and hours <laughs> sitting and watching them. They'd come up onto the ice just by the few places that were still open and feed on top, of, on top of the ice for a good hour or two in the middle of the day. But while I was sitting and watching them, one thing that came back to me was everything I had been taught in university about animal behavior. And that is that all animals should be following a rhythm. We are all entrained, we have an internal clock, us and anything, any other organism, that tells us when to get up and when to go to bed at night, as well as when to do basic bodily rhythms. But me watching a beaver in the middle of winter, out on the ice in the middle of the day, didn't follow this because I knew in the middle of summer, beavers aren't on the ice in the middle of the day, or not out, out in the middle of the day, they're out in the middle of night, which means they were going against the circadian rhythm. They were shifting from winter and summer to being a nocturnal to a diurnal species. 
And so in deciding what I wanted to do with my masters, it really dawned on me that there was a gap in interest here in that we didn't know much about why species might be very flexible in what they're doing and whether all species are this flexible or whether some species aren't flexible and others are. Um, and it made sense the more you think about it, if you're an animal and you don't have a nice warm house to go to, if you're gonna go out in the middle of winter, you're gonna wanna go out in the middle of the day and not the middle of the night. You don't wanna be out at minus 40 with a wind chill and no sun. Um, but that is what actually caused me to figure out where I was gonna go for my masters. And from there, I then spent a decade and a half traveling across Canada, living in various places and becoming overly educated. Um, but I split my time between, in most of these cases, between a major city and a major university and the Yukon. Um, and so, yeah, I did my master's and my PhD at McGill. University of Alberta was partly my PhD, but then a postdoc, and then I went to University of Toronto for a second postdoc before Thompson Rivers, before Nancy retired. And Thompson Rivers grabbed me, and I came back across. Um, but all of that time, a lot of time was spent up in the Yukon, which is what I'll talk a lot more about today. And so although the questions I wanted to answer when I started all of my graduate studies was sort of the how flexible animals are in activity and maybe what the consequences are, I very quickly realized that in order to figure those out, we first had to figure out how do we actually measure behavior in a wild animal? Um, because that, we didn't have much to go on. Um, the traditional way is what all of you are probably very good at, which is going out and doing direct observation, sitting and watching animals and recording, well, if you're a scientist, recording what, you're, what they're doing instead of just taking it into your mindset. Um, you can also do indirect observation, uh, which is something going along and following snow tracks. These are great, both great. I've done more than my fair share of them, and I love doing this, taking this approach, but they're limited when it comes to science. You can follow one animal for one day, you've got one data point. You need more than that. And especially if you wanna ask questions like, how does a ch change in temperature cause a change in behavior? There's no way you could do that without hiring an army of people to have 20 people out following all the animals. You also have to have perfect conditions. So snow tracking is great, but if it hasn't snowed in three days, all of a sudden you can't really follow anything. So although great, we needed a better ways. Um, and that is where technology came into play. I spent most of my graduate work uh, figuring out which technologies might be usable and sort of paving the way for the, their use in wildlife research. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these and I'll spend more time at the end talking about the last one because it's where I brought the most videos of cool things. Um, but we'll start with the first one, which is the temperature logger. And what temperature data loggers are is they were the first thing I used. So when I started my master's, these other things didn't really, weren't on the radar, no one knew about them, so we started with the temperature data loggers. And the reason temperature data loggers allow us to get at to behavior is if you attach one to an animal, it records the temperature around, the immediately surrounding the animal. And so if you put it on an animal that uses a nest or a den, you can get a really nice profile of when they're in the nest and when they're out of the nest. Because when they're in their nest, it's like us in our bed. We've got nice, warm, stable temperatures. Um, and then as soon as you leave the nest, you get these massive and steep declines. And so this is a profile of one animal for one day. Um, and you've got warm and stable up nest and then really cold and variable when they're out of the nest. And you can then train the computer to determine what the breakpoint is between those two. And all of a sudden you have a profile of when the animal was in the nest and when it was out running around throughout the day. And if you put these on enough animals, then you can all of a sudden have a large uh, record um, of what the species was doing across different conditions. And so I spent my masters doing this. I think I put 100 out on red squirrels um, and I was just looking at maternal behavior and looking at how that shifts from uh, when they're breeding in February to when they're feeding in June. Um, and I didn't, I don't really have much to show of this. You can go to the next slide if you want, I think. Um, I'm not gonna show too many results on this, but just generally the females, while they're looking for their young, they completely shifted their behavior from being active um, during the warmest part of the day during winter to being active at the coldest part of the day in the summer. 
So they were shifting to match thermal conditions to be optimal for their own self and to lower the cost to themselves. So this my, was my master's and it was highly successful. So then when I came to do my PhD, we wanted to go a little bit further and have a better understanding of how animals are changing behavior over larger time scales. And while the temperature data loggers were really highly effective for my masters, they had limitations. The one was they'd only record for five days. So you would have to go and trap individuals every five days and switch them out, uh, which makes them probably more work than they're worth. The other thing is you only get in and out of the nest. We don't get any additional information about what they're doing when they're out of the nest. And so when I started my PhD, there were a few bird studies that were using a device called an accelerometer. And what an accelerometer is, is it is the main component of a uh, Fitbit or your watches or your phones. It's what tells all of those devices what you are doing, whether you're standing, whether you're walking. It's what's counting your steps if you're paying attention to doing step counts. And the way it works is it has three dimensions and it measures acceleration across those three dimensions. So it measures acceleration um, in your forward and backwards motion, your side to side motion, and your up and down motion. And every behavior that you do or an organism does creates its own unique signature across those three axes. So you have running signatures, which are highly variable, high acceleration. You have not moving where they're, you know, not moving, <laughs> there's nothing going on. And then other behaviors will give slightly different signatures. Um, and so we went, okay, well, these work for humans. Maybe they work for wild animals. And we went about trying to actually create the algorithms to allow us to transfer these random signals of squiggly lines into what the animals are doing. And this was not a small feat. It involves a lot of work. Um, first off, we had to go and trap the animals so we could put the devices on. And I worked on three different species across my PhD. So the red squirrel, the snowshoe hare, and the Canada lynx. Then you have to actually go and get data on what the animals are doing at the same time that the device is recording. And I spent hundreds of hours outside watching the different species and recording what they were doing. So squirrels annoyingly would run out of, your shot, run out of view every two minutes. Um, lynx mostly just slept. So you had to spend a lot of time to get anything. And hairs we did in an enclosure. But once you have all of that, you go back to your, you go back to the university, you sit down on your computer, and then you start to figure out how you actually align these two things. So most of you probably are old enough that you remember uh, the national time signal and having to change your watches to match the time signal. That's because no clock runs at the same rate. And this is true of any device other than phones connect, anything connected to the internet now gets that signal every day and updates itself. And so it was a <laughs> more frustrating than I can talk, I don't know, more frustrating than I can imagine, was trying to actually align the times that I had from the observations to the times that were on the devices, because I needed them to align to a second. Um, so I spent way too much time combining those. But once you do combine them, you can then run an algorithm and you can create decision trees and basically AI algorithms that will tell the, that can tell the computer, okay, when you see this signature, this is now this behavior. And we managed to do that for all three species. On top of that, because I said this is adventures and there are trials and tribulations, uh, there was also a ton of work put into figuring out how to actually attach these devices to the animals and have them work. My first year, we worked only on red squirrels, and in the first two or three months, I think I had about a 30% success rate of when I got the devices back that they actually were still working and had data on them. And it was because there was everything from squirrels chewing or scratching the cables and wires and cutting them to the devices corroding from the little bit of humidity that is in the Yukon. Um, and so I spent four months just trying to figure out how do we actually package these in a way that's going to allow them to survive a couple of weeks on an animal. And this then is just, I think, one of three pages <laughs> of uh, protocol that I had to develop of how to de package these. And so it ended up having saran wrap folded in a specific way that made them slightly waterproof, dipped in wax, 
Then we cut up pop cans and beer cans to make an aluminum casing that we could wrap around it and create a little package that we then would attach with heat shrink to the collar that we were putting on the animal. And you had to figure out how to do the heat shrink so that it would actually hold the device on and we wouldn't lose anything. But eventually you do it and you get them out and they work. And after nine months of being, I did a nine month stretch in the Yukon, my first PhD field season. But you come back and you get everything working and you get everything aligned and you do all the algorithms and you get a graph like this, and this makes it worth everything. And this, so this is from Red Squirrels from that first season um, where we had devices out most of the way from February all the way to October, or to thank, oh, I guess I ended just before Thanksgiving that year. Um, and this is just the minutes of stay that the squirrels, every squirrel that had a collar on was spending traveling or run, out running around across the year. Um, and essentially what squirrels are doing is they're going from 30 minutes and essentially a couch potato in the middle of winter to during their hoarding season, they were out running for eight hours out of the day. Not just feeding, this was running. Feeding was on top of that. And so you've got this amazing flexibility of being able to be a couch potato to an ultra marathon runner back to a couch potato all within 12 months and they'll do this every year. And so this was fascinating. I thought this was so cool to see um, that animals can have this much flexibility. So then we turned our attention to the other main prey species that's in the Yukon, the snowshoe hare, and wanted to see whether or not that flexibility was similar in the snowshoe hares because they're experiencing the same conditions. It gets just as cold for them, if not colder, because they don't have a nest to go into. Um, and after another couple of years, <laughs> finally had data on the snowshoe hares using the same devices. And this is the comparison between the red squirrels and the snowshoe hares. And where the red squirrels have this crazy reduction in winter, the snowshoe hares don't so much. They've got much more stable activity right through the year. So this is 50% of, this is 50 of their day is active. They're out running well. They don't run as much, but they're out foraging, looking for food. Um, and so this was okay, this was cool. We're like this. Um, and that led to the final part of my PhD was, well, if you we have these two different strategies over winter by the two main prey species that are in the Yukon forest, what are the consequences of these squirrels kind of dropping out of the system on what the Canada lynx are feeding on, as well as does that have any cascading effects down on back onto the snowshoe hares? And this going after this question was driven partially by my own observation in that I was a very good squirrel hunter by this time. I had trapped hundreds and hundreds of squirrels, but in trying to get all that winter data, I had very quickly realized that squirrels in winter are really hard to find. Um, and they're very quiet and I would, you know, with all my skills, I was having trouble to get them. And so it's kind of from those observations that I was like, well, if I'm having trouble, surely the predators and the lynx are also having these same problems of finding the squirrels. And so that's where we started our Canada lynx work. Um, but in order to get at what the lynx were eating, we kind of had a couple, we only had one option that we really knew would work, which was going out and tracking animals, following their tracks, finding where they killed something and recording what they killed. But that's a lot of work. It's been done previously. You end up with sort of one average value for the year after hundreds of hours of snowshoeing. So we were sitting in our <laughs> cabin in the Yukon um, one evening trying to figure out what other way could possibly work. And my supervisor at, from the University of Alberta kind of just said, hey, Emily, what do you get if you put a microphone on a lynx? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I guess you, I mean, you should hear something. <laughs> but I was like, there's only one way to find out. We just have to try it and see. And so that's what we attempted to do. Um, we went and found some spy microphones that were small enough uh, to attach to a collar of a lynx. And we got five for our first year. I think we were gonna put out 20 collars or something. So we decided we'd go to try five. That's enough that if a few of them fail, 
hopefully we get one back and we'll get, know what's going on and whether or not they work and we should invest money. Um, so we got these spy microphones, they're from Russia, they're super small. Um, the spy microphone itself is only this part and then we had to attach a large enough battery that it would last for a decent amount of time. Um, and then we had to figure out the next hardest part, which is how do you actually put a collar on a lynx? And if you hit it once more, this is a video, and I'll talk while the video is playing. And so this is a trap. Um, these are handmade out of PVC pipe and chicken wire, essentially a nice little house uh, that they can go into. It has a sliding door down the front. Um, and then inside of there, we have a pin that I'm just grabbing that attaches to a cable that runs to the very back of the trap and down to a treadle. Um, I'm just getting the bait out of the way because whatever was in there last got it all tangled. But it attaches to the treadle that you see being pulled up and then that pin feeds through to the front and then front and then we can have the door propped up on top of it. And so what happens is that a lynx should hopefully come in, become interested in going in, goes in, sets off the treadle, and the door shuts. I will say I did not mean to do that. <laughs> but it makes for a really great video showing how these traps work. Um, and lynx are smaller than I am, so they actually get caught inside. So then inside we have bait. Most of the years that I worked, the snowshoe hares, there were lots of snowshoe hares around, and so there was always roadkill, because we were right, working right along the Alaska Highway. So we mostly just would drive up and down the highway while we were checking traps, and if we found roadkill, we'd grab it, and then we'd use that to bait our traps. Um, we also would use scent lures. So I was, we were a very smelly group of people. Because um, one of the number one scent lures that you use for Canada lynx is uh, skunk scent. And so you spray a little bit of skunk scent out, um, and that would attract them from a large distance. And when they get closer, they'd see the bait and go in. And then if you're lucky, you get a lynx in a trap. And then you have to deal with the lynx. And this lynx, the reason the door is open is because we actually, he has a collar already. We didn't want him. He was just eating our bait. So we were trying to get him out, <laughs> and he didn't want to get out either. Um, but for the ones that we did want and wanted to you put a collar on, we would transfer them to this crate, uh, which we had to self-design. Again, trials and tribulations. Our first year, we used a dog crate. But then trying to immobilize the <laughs> links in a dog crate led to probably lots of health and safety issues that we're not going to tell the university went on. Um, but we developed this crate that allows us to actually the back moves forward so you can squeeze the links and get them immobilized a little bit so that someone can go in and inject the drugs safely into their leg. Um, but we transferred them to the crate and we took them into uh, the local vet's house and did the immobilizations there. During immobilizations, we would check their health, we would take blood samples, and then we would attach our collar. And then we would bring them back once they had woken up to where we had trapped them and we would release them. And this is another little video of releasing a lynx, which is the best part, it was the best part. And often this is what happened. We would stand there and be like, okay, get out. A little bit of encouragement. And out he goes. And here you can see how much they're floating on top of the snow. I was definitely sinking in the snow and just roams off. And then if we got lucky, we got to see it again, but <laughs> often not. And so this is what happened to Max the Lynx. This is how Max's story started, is in our very first year, he was one of the Lynx that happened to get that audio recorder. Um, I first met him in a trap at a trap and he was full of testosterone and a very angry lynx, uh, which is partly why he got the nickname of Mad Max, which we shortened most of the time to Max. Um, and so we did this and we released him and he seemed to be okay with humans and then the film crews came and wanted to film lynx and we let them have Max and they spent 76 days following Max and while Max, they were 
filming Max, I was out on snowmobile and snowshoes tracking all of the other links to record what they were killing and when, so we could use that information to try and combine with the technology to automate the process. Um, and unfortunately, Max's story almost ended at that point because as we were getting to the time that we were going to take the collar back from Max, Max just disappeared. We no longer could get his signal, we couldn't hear anything from him, we didn't know where he was. And so we ended the field season not getting the collar back and just deciding he was a lost, lost cause, he had taken off. The following winter, we got a phone call from Alaska in that there was a lynx with a collar harassing our chicken coop down by Kenny Lake. Um, and over the course of the week, he had killed six chickens, three ducks, and a sheep. <laughs> and the farmer had decided he didn't want to kill the lynx, but he was tired of this and then something had to be done. So he locked <laughs> the lynx in the chicken coop and called Alaska Fish and Game and said, I think one of your lynx is here, it's got a collar, can you come and do something with it? Alaska went, looked at the lynx, said, well, that's not our collar. Um, but they immobilized it, put on a new collar, transferred him further, and then called Aston when they realized it was our collar. And we quickly realized that it was Max. Um, so Max, this is the first fame that Max got, is he got news articles written about him all over Alaska, as well as CBC Radio we did interviews on, talking about this amazing journey that the Sklinks had taken going from Kluwani and Yukon all the way up and over the mountains and in, down into the Alaska. But the other important thing is we got the collar back um, and it had some audio on it. And so did, we, I think we got four audios back in that first year to five. Um, and I got to sit down and figure out, did we actually get anything with audio? And this is a clip of one of the things that we got. So you can hear walking. And then some sort of communication. <laughs> And this could go on for 10 minutes <laughs> while walking. <laughs> you can stop him. The only thing we got is in case anyone wanted to know, do links purr? The answer is, you can hit it again. Okay. Links do in fact purr. Links are essentially just large house cats. Um, we would hang feathers on trees and you would get footage of them coming along, just walking through the forest, noticing a feather hanging in a tree and just start swatting and playing with it. Um, but the most important thing that I found on Max's collar is on the next slide. And this was hunting behavior. And this is what I wanted. We wanted to know whether or not we could actually document what the leaks are killing and when they're killing and how much effort they're giving, putting into killing things. Um, and so this is a clip of Max hunting. Um, I will say you're gonna hear something die, I apologize. Sorry, I'm a biologist, we like these things. Um, but I was looking through Max's color and this is what I found and I like immediately had to email all of my supervisors and be like, I think it works. Um, and what it is is you not only did we have what, how they were hunting, so we could tell that he was slowly stalking, we could get that one little movement, we knew how long they're chasing for, how much effort they're putting into that chase. But the most important thing was because prey were vocalizing, we knew what they were hunting. And we could use that to figure out what the differences are. But the other cool thing with the lynx is because the lynx collars had the audio recorders, they had a GPS on them, and they had the accelerometer on them, 
we can actually piece together in minute to minute detail what the links were doing throughout the day. And so this is just a track of one of the links um, starting at 8.30 in the morning on the far corner and the blue is walking. So he just walked for an hour and a half, came down out of the subalpine and down off to, onto a ridge where at the white spot, he stopped and had a nice little nap for a couple hours. Then he got up, walked a little bit and sat down and for an hour and a half had an argument or a conversation with another lynx, mm -hmm. which we were able to hear from the audio recorders. Um, and after that, we call it a fight here. I do have a student now who's gonna try and figure out a little bit more what these vocaliza different vocaliza vocalizations might actually be being used for. But at this point I call it a fight because it sounds, <laughs> sounds like angry screaming. Um, after that hour and a half then moved along um, and at 1.30 he chased something but was unsuccessful. So from the audio we could tell that he didn't get anything carried on a little bit further at the next dark star, chased something but actually managed to kill it. And then both through the vocalization and how long he then spent eating from both the audio and the, uh, from both the audio and the accelerometer, we could pull out feeding behavior. And because he spent at least half an hour eating, we knew that it was a hare that he had killed. Then carried on walking for another couple, I think another hour down, continuing downhill, this is all downhill towards the Alaska Highway, uh, where he then sat down and had a six hour nap. Uh, got up at about 10.30 at night, continued on down, then had a series of three chases that were unsuccessful. The unfortunate thing, we don't know whether it was the same thing, but every couple of minutes chased something else. Continued on, sat down for an hour and groomed himself, because he is a cat loves grooming, carried on, had one more chase that was unsuccessful, and then moved along and down by the highway, he just started feeding um, without a chase. So we can only assume that he was eating carry-on or potentially was in one of our traps eating bait. Um, it's, about, it's about the right spot for one of our traps. Um, but we have this amazing now record of these links. Um, intimate detail, we don't only really have this for one day, the audio recorders lasted for 45 days, the accelerometers lasted for the same amount, and the GPS, so we have a 45 day record of individual links of what they were doing in their life. And that allowed me to actually go back and ask or answer the question that I had wanted to ask right from the very start, which was, when the, snow, when the red squirrels drop their activity in the winter and kind of become couch potatoes, does that have any impact on what the lynx are eating? Um, and so each one of these bars is the makeup of what the lynx were eating in the months. So this is January, February, March. All blue means that the only thing that we were capturing on all of these devices is that they were eating snowshoe hares. And red is where they started to eat uh, red squirrels. And sure enough, it aligns with the squirrel activity as well. The squirrels increase their activity as they head into spring they start to pop back up into the lynx's diet. And so the whole system of snowshoe hares, lynx, and red squirrels is driven partially by the red squirrel activity. And there's gonna be more on that in future years, but <laughs> haven't fully got there. And so this brings us back to Max. Max is famous for three main reasons. Max traveled to Alaska and killed a bunch of <laughs> chickens and a sheep. <laughs> Um, which got him notoriety across Alaska and the Yukon. He was a poster child and is the first time that a filmmaker has been able to capture a lynx killing and hunting a snowshoe hare in the wild. It took a filmmaker 76 days to get there. Um, but the last one is that he was one of the first lynx to carry an audio recorder, um, which has really changed how we can go about actually studying predators in the wild. Uh, up until now, we've only been able to study kill rates and looking at what predators are killing for those that kill large things like deer and moose. Because it was all based on whether or not we could see patterns in GPS of them returning to constantly to the same spot. But we've never been able to actually document in a way um, like we have the smaller prey. And so this has kind of opened the door to new ways of studying wildlife. So that's where I've come from. 
I'm now at TRU, um, and I now have an amazing group of students working with me on all sorts of projects. And I'm hoping that over the next few years, you will get to hear from a bunch of them on what they're doing. I'm sure Nancy will rope some of them in. And you heard from Ollie last week, who did bears. Um, some of them are continuing to work on the Yukon, but I also have students working more locally. I had one student looking at squirrels and whether heat and smoke influences them in the Kamloops area. Um, and if I still have time, I just have a few more videos of links, of cool things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a video. So this is a video. So this is, I would say this might even be Max. Um, it's either Max or Eric Link's called Sue, but got trapped, had a collar, we didn't need it. We didn't need him to be in the trap. Um, so this is just me releasing him. And I don't, can't tell you what I'm doing here. I have no idea. <laughs> I think for some reason I might have been scared of the Link's so <laughs> and opening the door. But I eventually just gave up and opened the door. And just trots away. So yeah, it's just heading down. I mean, he's using the trail because <laughs> it's easy walking. Um, but it's just a cut line into the forest. Um, so these other two videos are things where we know helped me notice. Oh, this is a long one. Um, I might come and see if I can shorten it. I meant to cut this and didn't have time. Anyways, this is one of the few family groups that allowed us to get allowed me to get close to them. Um, and so this is a mother lynx, and she has two kittens with her. Uh, the kittens are eight months or something old. Um, and I caught up to them just after they had killed a snowshoe hare. And the importance of this video is we'd never really, well, we knew that there were lynx that hunted in groups. Eventually it calms down and <laughs> focuses on it. Um, well, we knew that lynx, some lynx hunt in groups. A lot of lynx are solitary animals. They don't want to have anything to do with other animals except for their long conversations. Um, but some of them we know hunt in groups, and some of them are just mom and kittens. We didn't know how they actually went around sharing the food. We knew they hunted together, and they would kill together. But do they eat together? Or is there some other dynamic going on? And this is one of the few times that I managed to see a family group hunting and eating. And the answer is they don't eat together. As you can see, the kitten is standing in the background watching mom. <laughs> Um, while well, she's tucking away at the snowshoe hair. And eventually, in a couple, in a couple, I don't know, a few more seconds, she'll finish up, and then we'll see what the kitten does. <laughs> or maybe we won't. <laughs> okay, so she, she gets up, and she's finished, and she walks away, and immediately the little kitten hops over the snow, comes running down, and he sits down and tucks away. Um, so it really seems that when they kill something, one lynx takes a dominance and eats, and the others have to sit and wait for the leftovers, of which there's not very much when there's a snowshoe hare. So then this is the last one, and this is just was my favorite moment in the field. This is the same family, so the mom and her two kittens. And so this was about nine kilometers off the highway, so I had snowmobiled for about half an hour to get into the area left the snowmobile, got on my snowshoes, and then hiked another, I think, two kilometers with the radio collar signal, trying to track her. And I came up over this hill, and the hill was in the sun, and as I looked down below me, about 50 meters, uh, the mum and the kittens were all curled up into one big fluff ball. Um, and they sat and they slept for two hours, and I just, it was sunny sat down in the snow, I had my camera, um, and I sat and watched them for those two hours. And then at the end of the two hours, which is what this video was, is they get up and stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch, and then finally they head off, and I decided I should go back to camp before someone's wondering where I am. And that's basically all I have to say 
for today. Um, I do have to thank, I had a lot of funders. There was also a huge number of people involved in this project. There are also three grad student, PhD students that I used to have a slide in that acknowledged them specifically. We were a team of PhD students who did all of this work together. Um, two of them took on all of the snowshoe hair work. Two of us took on all the links work, but we collaborated in the field and helped wherever it was needed. Um, and none of it would have been possible. There's no way you can study three species by yourself. <laughs> um, but a huge amount of thanks to both the Kalani group and my lab that I was working with. And with that, I am happy to answer questions. Um, working back to the graph that you had about the January to March, April, and then the big gap for the summer. Yes. So that was the limitation of how long the equipment would operate? Yeah, so because we were going for pretty fine scale things, um, we had our GPS running at, I think we were taking half hour fixes, which is pretty frequent for large mammals. Um, it meant that our collars, and because we had all these fancy other technologies on it, we didn't wanna take the risk of leaving them out over the summer. Um, so yeah, it was limitations on the devices and then on time and money. Uh, there also becomes more complicated trapping in the summer because you have to deal with bears um, and figure out how to not feed the bears while still trying to trap. Um, and we didn't really wanna cover that. At that same point, we now are constantly talking about, we don't know what they eat in the summer because they don't eat snowshoe hares. We were following snowshoe hare mortality the whole time we were there. So we had collars on those hares and we checked them daily to see whether or not they were still alive or not. They have little signals that tell you when they died. Um, and the mortality of the hares is super high in the winter, but as soon as you hit the summer, it goes to zero. Like no adult hares are dying, which means the lynx aren't eating <laughs> adult hares at all. Um, and so we have no idea what they eat in the summer. I think it has to be ducks and waterfowl, but we don't know. We don't know. Um, in the future, we want to get that gap. Yes. Why do the red squirrels run around so much? Are they looking for food or something else? Uh, that that peak of like eight hours, that is them getting their food. So they collect all the food they need to supply them for the whole year in a span of about three weeks in the fall. Um, and so this, po especially in this population in the Yukon, in the Kalani region, we only have white spruce. So it's a, basically a monoculture forest. Um, and the white spruce cre creates its cones every, well, creates cones every year. Those cones are only ripe and full of seed. Um, for about a two to two week window is where they've got like peak seed mass per cone before they open up and release all the seeds. And the squirrels have to get the cone, basically collect all the food and all the cones in that short little window. Um, and so they go mad. The other thing is with the white spruce is it doesn't produce a lot of seed every year. It produces massive amounts of seed every, I think we've moved it down to three, every three to 10 years. Um, and then the years in between, there'll be almost no cones produced or moderate small amounts. Um, and so that graph, I just happened to be working in a year where there was a massive amount of cones. So they were not only collecting food for one year, but at least the males are collecting food for multiple years in that sort of three week window. So they're going to the max because it's a few weeks that they have to get everything that's gonna keep them alive for the future. No, we have no idea. Um, some of it could be grouse. When I was snow tracking, I definitely found, so spruce grouse and rough grouse up in the Kalani region. Um, and we definitely, I definitely found gr grouse kills. They're not as plentiful, so some of them could be that. Some of them are just, it was a short feeding and there was no indication that it had, was a red squirrel. Um, but it could have been that they were full. They killed and they were full, so they only ate a tiny bit of a hair. Um, but yeah, we have no idea what those others are. Could it be carrying some of them? Could, could it be carrying some things? Or? And it could be carrying, yeah. Yeah, it could be carrying. Um, 
Yeah, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely dead things lying in the forest <laughs> that they do find. Okay, well, join me in thanking Emily. Thank you very much.